morning, everybody. <coughs> My name is Tom Kirsten, and I'm going to t uh, tell you something about Ansible and the way that I use it. Uh, the people that were here f for the previous talk by Jan Piet Mens will be a little bit disappointed because it's, well, got a quite a lot of overlap because first I tell you how Ansible works and that's about what Jan Piet told you and then I've got a little, well, a little deviation of that but I think about 80% will be the same. Too bad. I didn't know the schedule until a little, uh, well, a couple of days ago. So. It doesn't matter because I wasn't able to attend the previous session. Well, you won't be disappointed, <laughs> then all, all will be new. Well, we start off with the introduction. Well, the, most, of, most of the time is that the best place to start. Uh, then the reason why I use Ansible. In fact, it's quite simple. Uh, the reason why you use Ansible, people running away. Uh, the reason is quite simple. You want a simple tool to do everything you want in an easy way. Nothing special, nothing fancy, nothing too difficult. It has to be understandable by every, everybody who needs to use the systems and run the systems. Uh, the third part will be how will you be using it? Well, that will be the major part of this presentation. Then, of course, a recap, a little resources. Where can you find information about Ansible? And the last part, questions, of course. Well, first off, who am I? Well, I'm a Unix Linux consultant at AT Computing in the Netherlands. And I do that since 2001. And I'm also a teacher for a couple of courses of AT Computing. I'm a Unix nerd. I started in 1986, a long time ago, during my study. I was introduced to Unix by one of our teachers, and, well, I never looked back, in fact. Uh, in 1992, somebody introduced me to Linux. It was quite new then, so I started using Linux. And, well, of course, as most of you know, Linux, well, why would you use Windows if you've got Unix? I'm an absolute scripting nerd. Uh, shell scripts, Python scripts, it doesn't matter. As long as it scripts, I write it. Uh, I'm a free and open source enthusiast. Why would you buy something if you can have it for free and adapt it if it needs adapting to your own wishes? Well, programming, of course, if you are a scripting nerd, you program. And I love plain text. These sheets are all made in plain text, of course, with LaTeX and things like that. I hate things like LibreOffice, Microsoft Office, all <laughs> things like that. I hate it. I can't manipulate it the way I want, so I hate it. And I'm a big, big fan of things that just work. Mm -hmm. Long time ago, just as Jan Piet told you, system managers started off using shell script. You run a shell script and that uses RSH, remote shell, to log into other servers and do things over there. And as things evolved, this slowly changed to SSH. But in fact, it was still the same way uh, to manage systems. It was not that easy to do, prone to errors and a lot of configuration drift. Systems differed from each other, and it was not the way to do it. Later on, there was a tool parallel SSH, so you could log into 15 systems or whatever at the same time and perform the same commands on all systems. But if one of the systems wasn't reachable or reacted an, another way, uh, a command didn't run completely or gave an error or whatever, things would change as well. So it was not the way to go. Another system is cluster SSH that works the same way as parallel SSH. You log into a lot of systems at the same time and do all kinds of things. The same thing you can do with screen synchronized windows or TMUX synchronized panes. The problem is that things get out of control. Things keep changing. Systems are not kept equal as they should be or you get configuration drift. Things change not in the way you want it but that just happens. So, other tools were developed. One of the first that was developed was CF Engine, and it's used quite a lot. More, uh, at the moment, we have got CF Engine 3, I think. At our company, AT Computing, we use CF Engine 2. We didn't switch to CF Engine 3 because the syntax changes a lot. So, we are still in the midst of it. Are we going to switch to Puppet or Ansible? Well, I prefer Ansible. Some colleagues prefer Puppet. The war isn't over yet. Uh, another system is Puppet. Nothing wrong with Puppet. It's a very good system. 
uh, I use it a lot for my work. Never use chef, never use soul stack, never have used Yuyo Capistrano fabric. There are a lot of systems to maintain your system configurations or to make sure that your systems are up and running and configured properly. But what I want is just a simple command. I run a command and things work. That's it. No fancy root, DNS, or whatever uh, tricks to do, or running daemons or whatever. Just a simple command, I get some output, and things work. That's it. Well, of course, as you can see, uh, as, uh, if you have seen the talk of Jan Piet, you immediately recognize this as Ansible output, and even the command Ansible playbook. Just give me a playbook with uh, some commands in it. We come into playbooks a little further on. But this is, in fact, the way I want my work to be done. Run a simple command, get things done quick and easy. If that's the way you want to have things done, you end up with Ansible, well, quite fast. <coughs> because you do not have to install daemons. You do not have to install all kinds of weird things. You just need Python. Well, almost every Linux machine that you install today has, has Python installed. Uh, you only need a very small set of extras, a very small set of extras. So you do not need a master server, you do not need to dedicate a machine as a master server. You do not need any demons, things run as they are. You do not need any agents on the target machines that you want to manage. You do not need any databases to store configs in, or whatever configuration you could store in your databases. You do not need a separate PKI because Ansible runs over SSH. And as SSH is available on every machine, no configuration needed over there as well. It's very, very, well, and I mean very powerful. Uh, with Ansible, you can get everything done. As young Pete mentioned earlier, you can even break your systems quite fast. <laughs> See his blog for his sudo thingy. Uh, Ansible is very good in configuration management or deployment of files, configuration files, everything that needs to be on the other machine. Uh, it's very good at ad hoc functionality. Most of the configuration tools I know of, uh, like Puppet or CF Engine, are not that very good at doing things ad hoc, running once, making sure that a file gets copied to the other side. You need to write the configuration for that. And in Ansible you can run that just as a command and things get copied over to all the systems that you want to. And it's also used for continuous delivery. So you can run Ansible on a set of web servers, take a specific machine out of the load balancer, upgrade it, put it back into the load balancer, and then on to the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. <coughs> and Ansible has got very simple configuration files. It's just plain YAML. Nothing fancy, everybody can read it. Things get run in the order that they are in the configuration file, top to bottom, very easy to do. And of course, the word that always needs to be there if you're talking about configuration management, Ansible is either potent. If you run things twice or three, uh, three times or, or even more, things don't change if they are already in the order that you want to. Ansible. Set of the setup of Ansible is, in fact, very, very easy. Uh, from nothing, so from a plain Unix server, nothing installed over there, to production can be done within minutes. All you need is Python 2.6, plus Paramico, PyAML, and Jinja 2 on, well, the master server, the machine that controls the rest. And that's everything you need on all the servers that you want to control from Ansible, what you need over there is Python 2.4 or better, but it needs to be a Python 2 version. And if you have got 2.4, you need the simple JSON module. If you've got 2.5 or better, you only, you only need the Python version, nothing else. And Python can run in a virtual environment, a Python virtual environment, of course, in a very easy way, well, you all know Python or Python virtual environment. You just set it up and Ansible will run in there. You can also run it from Git, that's the way I do it. 
sometimes things break because I always run the development version. And I, then I get an email, the mail server isn't working anymore, or an SMS, or things like that. Most, most of the time from my girlfriend. But uh, You can run it from Git checkout. Uh, the, the Git repository is on GitHub, the complete Ansible source code. And Ansible uses plain SSH for the transport and the login into the servers under control of Ansible. You do not need root on the other side. Well, of course, as John Pete mentioned, for some tasks to be performed, you need root access, create a user, install a package, things like that. But you can use sudo to accomplish these tasks. But to log in into the other servers, you do not need root. Some security officers do not permit root login into a server, especially not without a password, and certainly not remote, uh, or even in DMZs and things like that. They will not allow that, so you have to use another user. Most of the time, I use the user Ansible. Everybody knows what that user does. And if you install Ansible, the Ansible master is on the control machine, the machine that does things, that could be your laptop or a server somewhere that, that you appoint that task. Uh, you've got a set of commands that you can use to perform Ansible tasks. The main command is the command Ansible. And the command Ansible is used to run ad hoc, ad hoc tasks or uh, ask queries on systems, perform single tasks, things like that. To run an Ansible playbook, so a set of commands with control to the other server, you use the Ansible playbook command. And as John Pete uh, specified, the Ansible pull command is used when you use Ansible in pull mode. Normally, Ansible is in push mode, so you've got a server that pushes all configuration to all the other machines, but you can have pull mode if you really, really need to. I've never seen it used in, in normal life, but if you really want, you can do that, and then you need the command Ansible pull. The Ansible doc command, created by Jan Piet, uh, shows you all the documentation. I think he's outside smoking. Yeah, he yeah. Uh, the Ansible doc command is uh, for all the documentation available in Ansible. Every Ansible module or every part of Ansible has got uh, inline documentation. And with the Ansible doc, you can read that documentation. With Ansible doc minus L, you get a list of all the available modules, and then you pick your model, module and Ansible doc, and then the name of the module, you get some information about that module. Ansible Galaxy, that's the new kid on the block. It's, uh, some people know the, RP, the Puppet Forge. This is a bit the same as Puppet Forge, but then for Ansible. The idea is the same. You create a, an Ansible role, you upload it to the, to the Forge, and other people can use your, use your stuff. And Ansible Vault is to store password. Well, encrypted stuff so that nobody can read it. And if you need it, you supply the password, and it is decrypted and then can be used, especially for passwords, key files, things like that. And Ansible consists of a lot of simple components, but I mean really a lot. Uh, last time I checked, I believe last week, there were 220 and more, and the, the, the number is still growing. And these modules are modules that can be used for to run a command on the, others, on the other machines. Uh, for files and templating, create, delete users, uh, change users, everything, you can manipulate users, uh, add or remove packages uh, with yum or opt or zipper or whatever. Uh, services, run a server, start a service, make sure it is running. Yes? Uh, is it supported by Ansible, like upstream, or are these uh, users? Completely? These are in the Ansible yeah. mainstream, yes. If you run a git pull or an uh, up get install or whatever of Ansible, you get, depending on the version you are getting from your upstream provider, uh, Ansible is in opt in April. That at least that I'm sure of. I'm not quite sure if it's in zipper, but you're always better off if you don't use zipper. But, uh, but it depends a bit on which version you get, how many you get, but. If you've got a, uh, the, the newest version 1.6 <coughs> and a bit from GitHub, you get over 220. But they are supported 
in Ansible. It, they are part of Ansible. So you don't have four opt, play, uh, four opt modules? No, no, there's only one. Opt install Ansible, that's all. It's over there in the next sheet. Uh, there are uh, modules to manipulate databases uh, and a lot more. See Ansible doc. At the moment, there are a lot of, uh, of there is a lot of development in the EC2 hook, of in the in the part for the Amazon clouds, uh, <laughs> things like that. And always, as always, with open source, if there isn't one you really, or if there is one you really need but it's not available, write your own. Send a pull request to GitHub, and it will be part of Ansible one day if it's good enough. And the install is very easy. On all operating systems, you can imagine that runs Python, even Windows. Support for Windows is a little bit dodgy at the moment. It's not, not really there yet. But in fact, every system that can run Python can run Ansible. And you can create a Python virtual env and then pip install Ansible. And then you get the version from pip. And I believe it's 1.5 at the moment. Uh, in CentOS or Red Hat Linux or Scientific Linux, it's available in the GPL repository, and you, then you just jump install Ansible. And on Debian and Ubuntu, it's available in the standard repository <coughs> with an apt-get install. You do not need to uh, install a PPA or anything like that. Or if you're running like I am from GitHub, the developer version, just a git clone, see the Ansible, sudo make install. That can break things, so be aware of that. In my case, it does break things. I always run the latest version from, from GitHub, but I'm trying to be one of the developers. It doesn't always succeed. Well, most of the time, I break more than I repair, but that doesn't really matter. But it's just kind of a hobby. But if you do run it from, from Git, be aware you can break things. It's not always the most stable version. It can be an intermediate one. And how Ansible works. In fact, it's in fact quite simple. This is a, in fact the same picture as that Jan-Piet had, just a little more stylish. And I stole it. I think I stole it from another side as he did. Uh, you've got a node. In this case, we call it the management node, but it can be your laptop. So you, if you end up with a customer and you bring your own laptop with Ansible installed on it, you can manage all the systems of those of of this client with their own. Ansible installation running on your laptop. You've got a file, that's the host file, in fact that's the inventory. What hosts do you want to run your Ansible commands on? All your modules, over 200 at the moment. Your playbooks or your roles, what do you, do you want to do on the systems? The definitions of that, and then a couple of nodes, depending on what you want to do exactly on which machine. On these nodes, there is no daemon running, not an Ansible daemon, but you need an SSH daemon to run over there to be able to contact the node. And the communication is completely over SSH. And I created a very small example network just to explain things of how Ansible works. I've got a management node, dns1.example.net, and it's also my DNS server. I've got two web servers, web1 and web2, and one TUN server, and the examples will be mostly for that TUN server, a virtual tunnel server. <coughs> but this is all, and these four nodes are all defined in my Ansible hosts file. These four hosts, I've got a group called DNS servers, and this is the ini style file for the inventory file. The DNS servers, there's only one host in there, but if I call an Ansible command for a set of servers called the DNS servers, all the servers in this group will be used. In this case, only one. In the second case, with web servers, these two hosts will be used, web1 and web2. And with my TUN servers, well, of course, only one, because there's only one server defined. And if I run a command on all servers, I get that list, the list of four. Uh, in my case, this is the default location of the Ansible file. I can, can, can specify any other file as a host file, but this is the default. So if you do not specify a file, Ansible will look for this file, etc. Ansible hosts. 
<coughs> I've also got a, a little file. This is already an example of a playbook, a small playbook, non, but nonetheless a playbook. This file specifies, I've called it site.yaml, but you can call it whatever you want. And what this file states, for all hosts, so all these four, DNS1, Web1, Web2, and Ton1, use the user Ansible, use sudo, and if you do use sudo, the user do sudo too, is the user root. And we've got two roles for that. One role is common, and one role is sudo. Not really fancy, but this is more or less the setup I use most of the time to start off with. So if you've got this to start off with, you can extend from that, and because this way you've got a set of things that just work. And I've got an include. This is the way to include a simple playbook. This is the, the way to use a role. Include playbooks, virtual tunnel, and then the file main.yaml. I've created my own little standard that a playbook always have is in the directory playbooks. The name of the playbook is called the Phaeton in this case. That's the name of the directory. And in that directory, I'll always have a file main.yaml. This looks a bit like the standard way of using roles. You need to define a standard for yourself so that things do not get messed up. Very messy uh, things like that. Order must be. And to run Ansible, you can use the Ansible command, and the Ansible command always has the, the same generic form. Ansible, then a list of hosts. Most of the time you tell it a group of hosts, or all. Then the module to run, and parameters uh, given to the module that is run, and maybe even more options. Well, I've got an example of that. Ansible all, minus M, ping. Ansible to all hosts. So all hosts, all four hosts that are defined in the host file. Min M, the module, the module is ping, and the minus O means this option gives me the result on a single line. Otherwise you get a JSON output, and this is part JSON output all put together on one line. So otherwise it wouldn't fit on a sheet. And the result of this command is web2, turn one, web1, DNS, all four hosts have success. And the answer to my command, ping, is the answer is pong. All hosts respond. So I've got a complete round robin check of the uh, Ansible. So Ansible can contact the, the host on the other side, can send over the module ping, can run the module ping, and the answer is returned back. So now I know that all hosts respond, and all hosts can run at least the minimum set of Ansible. And the command module, or the module here, the default module to run, so if you do not specify a module, the default module is the command module. So if you've got a command like this, Ansible, and then, for instance, all the servers in the web servers, minus A, so I only supply arguments, not a command module, or not a module name, so the default is the command module. And what do you want to do? Well, give me an ls minus l of the file ATSA password A. And the result will be something like this, like this. Server web 2, we have success, return code 0, and this is the result of the ls command. For server web 1, this is the result of the command. You see there is a little difference in the file, it doesn't really matter. To install a package in Ansible Talk, in fact, that it's, it's, well, just as easy as it would be with a standard yum command. You give it Ansible to all the servers in the group. Turn servers. <coughs> the module is called yum. And the argument, the name is virtual tunnel. I could supply uh, things like state is present, state is latest, things like that. But this is just the default, and the default state for a package is make sure it's installed. So what Ansible does, it logs into the other side, checks if there is a module of a package installed with the name 
Vita, if it is, it reports it's already there. If it's not, it will install it. Well, in this case, this example has been run before, so it says, I've got this package, and it's already installed. For people knowing uh, Puppet, there is a, mo well, a module, uh, a provider in Ansible called Package, that abstracts things for you, so you do not need to know if you uh, have yum or up or whatever. Uh, the philosophy in Ansible is, if you've got a Debian-based system or a Red Hat-based system, package names differ. For instance, if you've got a web server on uh, Debian, it's called Apache 2. And on a Red Hat-based type system, it's called HTTP. So if the names differ, you have to find out which name to use. But if you already have to find out which name to use on which system, why not supply the, package, the packager name as well? It's a philosophy, and I think it's not that bad. So if you know it's on a Red Hat system, just supply YUM. If it's a Debian-based system, just supply app or whatever. Yeah, but that still means you need to know which systems are Red Hat and which systems yes, are Yes, but Debian. you already need to know because the package names differ. Yeah, but th that's different, huh? That's, that's, you know in, in Debian it's, it's uh, Apache 2, in Red Hat Yeah, but if you know it in Debian that it's Apache 2, then you know it's Apache 2 on a Debian, so it's apt. Yeah, but, but the thing is, if you, you don't need to know which systems are running which operating system to, to launch the command. Yeah, you, you, you do, but you need to know the package name. You don't, know, don't need to know which systems are Debian or which are HTTP in your environment. If you can just say, install uh, Apache, and of course you, you need to have a way to clearly define on yep. Debian is this or and Red Hat that package, but you don't need to know which operating system. You do not need to know which operating system, but you need to know the package name. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree yeah. with that. But, but if you have to find out the package name, then it's just a jiffy to find out the packager manager. The package manager is part of the, uh, of the, the facts that are returned <coughs> from the system, so you could use a variable called Ansible Packager, Package Manager, I believe that it's called. So you can, you can differentiate in Ansible, you can say if it's a Red Hat system, use these set of commands, or if it's a Debian type system, use that set of commands. And, well, then you know if it's a Red Hat, then you know you have to use YUM. So you can differentiate that. But this this uh, package module, when, when was it added? Because I don't think it was... It, it, well, a long time ago it was not there, I think. It I know was. it's in 0 0.25. Mm. Well, I, I looked at it, but at Ansible some time ago, and that was like, oh, why do I need to know? Well, that's which, the philosophy, yeah. because package names differ on all kinds of systems. So if you have to know the package name, yeah, well, then the packager itself is not that difficult anymore. So just apply the packager. It makes all the modules a lot simpler. Well, in this case, on server ton number one, uh, I know this is a Red Hat system because I compiled it that way, so, or installed it that way, so that's not, not really uh, a surprise to me. Uh, and in, the, in this system, it's already installed. Now, you can use Ansible with all ad hoc commands. So, commands like this. But, in fact, then you are programming shell scripts or Python scripts or whatever. So, that's not quite a good idea. The way to solve that is in Ansible playbooks. And the playbook is a set of commands or a set of definitions, uh, a set of recipes that describe the state of a machine that you want it to be. So it's not what the system needs to do, but the state you want to be it in. And they are written in YAML, and they are recipes of the desired state. So it needs to be in that state. Uh, it can use the variables, variables you supply, or variables you get from factor or or, hey or factor or Ansible facts or whatever. Uh, it can contain handlers, so when a change, when a state changes, the config, configuration file changes, then you take the configured action, restart the web server, restart the name server, things like that. And they can be reused, so you can have a playbook that's run by all kinds of recipes, uh, or ad hoc, or whatever. Uh, an example of a, well, quite a simple playbook to install a virtual tunneling server on the host. Tunnel servers, you've got a task, the name is install package, as John Pete Oak explained, uh, also has explained. Indentation here is key. 
indentation is as the same uh, as in Python. Do not use tops. Uh, make sure everything is neatly aligned. If it's not neatly aligned, you get syntax errors. And you have a hard time figuring out where. So make sure that if you're using VI, then you come expand tabs as yes, somewhere in your environment, to make sure you do not get an, uh, an a straight tab somewhere. Uh, on the host turn service, there are a couple of tasks that need to be done. Uh, install a package through YAM. So make sure the package is installed on the other side. Also, deploy a configuration file. Make sure the configuration file is on the other side. And I do that with a template. And in the template, I can use variables from the system on the other side or wherever I get them from. Uh, where do we need to put that file? Well, it needs to be in the etc directory called vton.conf mode 0400. And if this file changes, notify restart of the virtual tunnel daemon. Because the virtual tunnel daemon needs to reload this file. And this is another of the, well, this is another part of the playbook. And it makes sure that the daemon is running. So the, on the other side there is a check uh, and it, to ensure that this daemon really is running. If it's not, it will be restarted. And once this is done from top to bottom, the last part of the file is the handlers section. And in the handlers section there is stated restart virtual tunnel daemon. The service called vtrundd, that's the name of the file in etc in a D or in system D or in upstart or whatever. What the service name is called and the state is restarted. And as soon as something here is changed, the handler is executed so the, re the virtual tunnel daemon is restarted. You can have more than one notify in your playbook, but in the end only one of these instances will be executed. So you do not end up with a, a web server restarting 20 times because you're on a playbook. That would be weird. And if you run a playbook, you can run it by hand, of course, <coughs> Ansible playbook, and then the name of the playbook file, the YAML file, that's uh, the definition of the playbook. And it doesn't really matter where you put it, but in my case, I put it in a directory playbook, virtual tunnel, main.yaml. And the output looks a bit like this, depending on th if things go uh, well or go wrong, and if you got CowSafe installed. Uh, Michael Dehaan, the developer of uh, Ansible, is a big fan of cows. So if you've got cowsay installed, messages are displayed with cowsay. So you get a lot of cows on your screen. Uh, the playbook is called Tunnel Service. So these are the machines that this play is run on. There is a task, and this is exactly the name as it is defined in the playbook. So install package virtual tunnel. OK, tunnel 1, so the package is now installed. Deploy the virtual tunnel config. OK, the file is deployed. Make sure the service is running and restart the tunnel serve. So it, in the end, it says I've got changed four. So four instances of the whole set are changed. One server is OK. Zero servers are unreachable. And none have failed. None tasks have failed. So as, as long as failed is zero and unreachable is zero, things went well. And in the playbooks, you can specify that you want to copy over a template using a template file. These are just plain Python Jinja 2 template files. And they are used by Ansible and they are parsed by Ansible. Variables are expanded and the result is sent over to the other side and placed in the place where you specified it. Uh, you can also have loops. Jinja 2 su uh, supports loops. Uh, supports co uh, commands, conditional, so you can have if statements. If that variable is defined, then do this. If it's not defined, do something else. And you can also have all kinds of filters. Read the Jinja 2 manual for this. It's quite large. And all the Ansible facts, and even the factor facts and the OHA facts, are available to your template, so you can use them to well, create your file to be on the other side. 
And an example of a time plate, the variables here are in red. So you can see what the variables are. Uh, in the top of the file, I always got a section called Ansible Information. And that's the, file, uh, the variable Ansible Managed, and that expands to this file is changed by, by Ansible, uh, user, tongue, uh, on date, template, file name, things like that. So that you can see this is done by Ansible. And the host name where it comes from. In the tunnel, you need to supply a password, so I've got a very secret password stored somewhere in Ansible Vault. And that's uh, inserted here automatically. You do not have to worry about that. The server address, a client address, these uh, variables are defined somewhere in Ansible. And the last one, command, the Ansible date time, and then the year, this is part, and it ends up being 2014 or 2013 the current year. And then a name, the name of the user, it's a variable that's defined and it ends up being by name in this case, so you can supply whatever you want. This file is parsed, all these variables inserted the way they should be, so the value is inserted and the file is sent to the other side and placed in the directory specified, etc slash vtum dot com, that file, minus the dot j2. But some way or another, the playbooks grow large. You end up with a lot of playbooks, and they are not really manageable. All the files of all the tasks you want to perform are in one file, and you end up with, well, almost unmanageable stuff. And the developers of Ansible saw that, and they created another way of managing all your Ansible configuration, and they created roles. And Ansible roles are a more standard way and uh, a way to change, well, in interchange roles with one another. Uh, well, I can, can give a role to you, you can give a role to me. We can share them on the internet. The way they are configured is a standard way. And it's a standard way of writing things. And they can easily be, sh be shared through uh, Ansible Galaxy. Ansible Galaxy is something like the Puppet Forge. And the structure is always the same. You can create uh, a structure, an empty structure with the Ansible Galaxy command and that su su supplies you with a structure something similar similar like this. I, I stripped some of the, of the directories out just to make sure that it fits all on one sheet. But if you've got a, an Ansible role, in this case, this role, you all, well, you end up with a directory files. If you need files to be transported to the other side, they will be placed here. If you have handlers so to restart services or things like that, they are defined in the main.yaml in the handlers directory. Uh, if you've got tasks to perform, they are defined in the main.yaml in the tasks directory. If you've got templates, they are stored in the templates directory. And if you've got variables, to define for this role, they are stored in the virus main.yaml. And that's a standard way to make sure that things always end up in the same place. So if I write a role, somebody else always knows where to look for things. And in playbooks, as they can grow very, very, very large, it's not always sure where to look. So in this case, it's always very easy to find things and to share things, because it's standardized. But you need to be able to use these roles in playbook. Well, the way to do that is, well, very easy, in fact. You've got a host definition, and then the keyword roles, and then the roles you want to apply to these, to these hosts. So in this case, hosts all, they get common users as pseudo. So there's a definition for all hosts, they all get the common one, the users one, and the pseudo was one. All my web servers get the Nginx role. And in the Nginx role, there is defined for install Nginx, create this config file, create that virtual host if needed, uh, all things like that. And all the host done servers get the roles virtual tunnel. So there is one machine that gets the virtual tunnel daemon. The tunnel daemon is started, and you can connect to that daemon. 
automatically. You always, you only need to run this once, and all your roads are configured. So now a short recap. I'm not quite sure how I am for time. Ah, oh, ten minutes. Oh well, easy. And the entire Ansible configuration, in my case, is in a Git repository, and I've created a script that I can run by hand that. Uh, installs and well configures all my hosts that need to be uh, configured through Ansible and the first thing it does is a git pull It'll get me the newest version from the Ansible configuration from the configuration repository and I use sudo for root commands so to be root on the other nodes the managed nodes I always use sudo never connect with root directly, because a lot of system managers forbid that. And I also have uh, authorized keys configured to make sure that my user that is, uh, is configured to log into the system on the other side, that the user is uh, automatically logged in so that I do not have to supply passwords every time. Uh, this script, in my case at home, is run every hour. So sometimes things break. Then the break is at my home, so nobody cares. Well, I don't. Uh, and uh, I get a log of every run to make sure that I can look back what, what happened. Because you're not looking at the console uh, all the time, so you're never <laughs> quite sure what happened an hour ago. So you always have to have the possibility to look back for auditing purposes and things like that. And I use Ansible callbacks to give feedback. So when a playbook runs, or a role runs, it sends back a command and with a status or whatever to make sure that I can lock things and can look back what happened. And I use roles as much as possible, but I started off with Ansible a long time ago, well, over a year and a half, and then roles didn't exist yet. So I started off with writing playbooks, and I'm in the way of converting all my playbooks into roles but I'm not really in a hurry. So it will be done, but it can take some time. Playbooks work out, well, just as well. But one of the things I try to do is make roles as generic, generic as possible. So the only thing that, can, of that will change in a role are the names of variables. So there's only one place to change a thing if I need a, a role at a customer side to install a web server. The only thing I need to do is change the virtual hosts that need to be there the directory where it all needs to end up, and some generic things. All the rest is automatically figured out by Ansible. So define the variables for a site configuration for the customer side. And that's, in fact, everything I need to change to use my Ansible role on every site where I end up configuring a web server or whatever, a DNS server you you can imagine what you need to do at the customer side. There is a lot of documentation of Ansible available, or a lot of sources where you can obtain information. Uh, of course, the website, the ansible.com. Uh, of course, the docs website of Ansible. Uh, on IRC, somebody mentioned earlier that the IRC channel is very good. Most of the time, I log in in the morning on my computer, and the first thing I start is IRC. To have a look if there is something new. Uh, the Twitter account of Ansible retweets everything with at Ansible. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a retweet of Michael the Hound, it's quite easy to do. Uh, on Reddit, there is a lot of information. The Google group, there is a group, uh, Ansible on Google Groups. Uh, there is a weekly newsletter that you can uh, subscribe to and check out and so study the source code from GitHub. The, uh, my opinion is that the source code of Ansible is quite clean. If you know Python, and you do not need to be a Python guru, but if you know Python a bit and you study the code of, of Ansible, it's doable. Let's put it that way. The, the code is quite clean, quite nicely written. And Michael Dahan, the, 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 uh, the first creator of Ansible, is, well, very peculiar about, very fanatic about 
style and structure, so it needs to be neat or it won't get into GitHub. And please, contribute to the Ansible code. If you know Python, and if you've got a good idea, check out the code, make a fork, create a new whatever fancy feature you want, and give it a pull request, and let's make sure it's getting better and better and better. And contribute to the Ansible documentation. Documentation can always be better. Most of us, us nerds are very good programmers, but very bad documentation writers. And some people are very good documentation writers. So please, if you are one of those, contribute to the documentation. And use roles from Ansible Galaxy. There are a lot of roles uh, at the moment, but some of them are better than others. If you find a role that's, well, not really up to scratch, uh, make sure it gets better and push it back to Ansible Galaxy. And spread the Ansible word, of course, to make sure that Ansible well, can overtake other configuration management tools or at least be as good as. Are there any questions? So you talked about how you can uh, have a, a left word, a load balance. Yes. One by one. Yes. So how do you achieve that? Uh, well, I can explain that quite deeply, but there is a webcast on the internet by Tim Bedwa, one of the founders of Ansible, that explains that in, into every detail you can imagine. But in fact, you, j just for the sake of it, you've got a web server and you've got a load balancer and an Ansible manage, manager node. First of all, you push a command to the load balancer saying take this web server out of the load balancing pool. That can be achieved. You, you can imagine that it can be done. Once you've done that, you upgrade your web server or do whatever you need to do there. And as soon as that comes back with a good result, you go back to the, uh, to the load balancer and push it back in. And in Ansible, you can say you've got 100 web servers. Do this in groups of five. So you can have, normally, if you say, do this to all web servers. All web servers will be simultaneously handled, but you can say groups of five. So if one group fails, then Ansible stops, but then you've got the previous groups or the next group that are not handled yet or are already handled and went correctly. So th those will be kept running. But have a look at the side of Ansible. There is a, quite an extensive webcast of, of, done by, I believe, Tim Berla. What about uh, Maurice? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we watched it together, so I know he was there as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation. I enjoyed. You're it. Welcome. Uh, I have a question about the, the roles. What happens if there are conflicting statements in, in different roles? For instance, in one role you say in this version of the package must be installed, and in another role it says a different version. Well, then, then you end up with a, a, a cyclic problem. It, 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 it's the same problem as you've got in all kinds of configuration management tools. Uh, a tool like Puppet prohibits that you've got uh, a name defined twice. In Ansible, that's not the case. You can have a name defined a hundred times if you like. But because Ansible is run top to bottom, the first time you say install package uh, Java 1.6, Java 1.6 is installed. Somewhere further along the line you say, I want Java 1.7. Yeah, then you get Java 1.7, no problem. But if that overrides 1.6, the next run you get 1.6 and something further along the line, 1.7 again. So you could break things, you have to be aware of that. Ansible doesn't care, it just does, does things. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, when you, so I, I really like the advantage to run ad hoc things. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, what happens if you like launch a command on several servers? You get uh, some feedback. Yes. Uh, is there a way to capture that feedback easily and then pipe it again to well, another the, 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 the command? For instance, like install this package or, uh, or do this on so many servers. Some servers fail. Let me uh, do it again, but only on those, for instance. Well, Ansible keeps track of what succeeded and what doesn't, so you can 
rerun the same playbook or the same ad hoc command to the to the well it saves a, a list a of file. yeah a retry file a list of hosts that didn't succeed so you can use that list to rerun the stuff yeah. again but to capture the just you, you, you get things back like this yeah. and if there are many hosts it's yeah. yeah yeah then it's a lot but it's possible uh, it's JSON format well and if you know Python or shell script or whatever you can parse here if things change you've got a return code uh, change this false so you, you can quite easily find out which host it, it concerned that wrote but if you want to know which hosts didn't succeed, you can have a look at the retry file. And even on the host that did succeed, you can just run it again and it won't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, well, depending on the command, if you, uh, just as uh, Pete said, if you have a, a command, shut down the host, well, the second time it won't run, of course. But if you have a command to install a package, if it's already installed, the package manager will tell you it's already installed, don't care. So if you run it again, it won't break things. That, that's why, somewhere over here, that one, Eden Potter. You can run things <coughs> multiple times without changing the state if it's already in the desired state. Oh, sometimes, yeah, you don't want to have, you don't have a command that's Eden so. No, of course, yeah. of course, you, you can have, yes. And Puppet, of, Puppet cares a bit about that because you can't run ad hoc tasks. Yeah. But Ansible, if, well, if you break things, yeah, you break things, yeah. It's up to you. Um, how do you deal with programs or, 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 or scripts that require a user interaction? I mean, for example, to put a password. Uh, uh, does it have a, a module or something like that? Or do you will try to just keep it? Well, well that, that will always be a problem if you run things in the background, because these things are run in the background of the system. And if you require user interaction, that will always be a problem. Depending on the command, some commands offer uh, a way to supply a password on the command line. So you can store a password in the uh, Ansible vault. Then you type the password to decrypt the Ansible vault and then supply the password to the command. But if you really need keyboard interaction, you're lost. You can have Ansible query for something, but you still need to have the command to yeah. be able to send it on a command line or something. Yeah, if you really need keyboard, inter for instance, a VI editor. You start a VI editor somewhere on a system way back. You won't succeed because you don't have keyboard interaction with the command. Because commands are run in the background. So there must be a way to supply the password in a file like MySQL database or on the command line. For example, MySQL database. Yeah? Yeah, thank you.